Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Because subscribers, you see, not only receive all new content directly to their email inbox as soon as it publishes, but they're also able to interact with every contributor on the site directly. And that includes me, which if you don't want to communicate with me. Okay. So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as every podcast, video, and written article by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Today, I am very, very honored to be speaking with actually a, a long distance friend of mine named Karen Ann Cocioli. Hi, Karen. Hi, how are you this today? I'm doing better and better. Now that we got on this podcast, it's going to be a, an amazing day. <laughs> well, I'm excited for this. I'm so excited. Cool. Thank you so much for, for, come, for agreeing to be on the show. Karen is a queer author and a public speaker. She's also author of the book Paradise, which is a queer memoir. All right, so Karen, on your website, um, you mention that a speech impediment that, that you had as a, as, a, as a youngster has informed a lot, not just about Paradise, but a lot of sort of your life journey. And can you, can you describe to us, first of all, how your childhood trauma ended up shaping you know, how you are today, what your adult life is today? Sure. So the, I had a very bad stutter and I had it when I was started, when I was, um, could talk. Uh, and when I was four years old, it, it was like really, really bad. And even at that very, very young age, I wasn't able to push words out the way I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And so I started to learn how to write and I started to learn how to, uh, you know, make my letters and my names. And, that, and all of a sudden I realized that, wow, I don't have to actually speak what I want to say. I could actually write it because, you know, when you have a stutter for that bad, first of all, the kids make fun of you. So mm -hmm. I was a very solitary childhood. It was, you know, lonely. Um, I lived in a multi generate generational household and we lived in a uh, I don't know for your listeners but they're called railroad apartments I grew up okay. in, in in Jersey City New Jersey and it was you know the smokestacks and warehouses and the bodega on one corner and the Italian on on the grocery store on another corner and it was you know so diverse and multicultural but in then within the apartment I had my mother my father my nonna it was my aunt and my father would tend to take people in when they needed to. And we're talking about a small apartment and railroad because you walked into the kitchen, then there was a bathroom and two bedrooms and then the living room at the end, you know? So I see. Okay. So, um, but then when I was five, we moved into a huge colonial home. My father did well in his, in his business and it, it was, it was lonely, but what the stutter did, was it forced me to explore language because not only, you know, sure. when we, when we speak, the inflection of our voices, the intonation, you could get a lot out of that, right? You ask a question and your voice raises or, you know, an exclamation point, but you can't do that. So when you're writing, you really have to then find the exact word that you want, you know, so it really helped me to, um, to explore that, you know, that, that piece of it. And, when I was um, five years old, we mentioned childhood trauma. Um, yes, I had, uh, uh, my father was very abusive. Um, he was sexually abusive. And, uh, you know, the first time that I had an incident with him, I was just like five years old and the stutter got worse and the loneliness got worse. Right. Sure. I, wanted, I wanted to seclude myself and I would, I would, go up so we had this um we had like three stories and then there was an attic but the stairs going up into the attic were very very narrow and so the adults okay. go up there right they're very narrow and small so i go up there and there was like a single 
cot bed almost, and of all things, a cross on the wall. I'm not sure why. And then this fanlight window. And I would literally sit up there because it was safe, right? Because I knew that yeah. no one was going to touch me. No one was going to, you know, I wasn't going to really be affected by anything. And I would just like literally just sit up there for hours and sneak up there at night and, you know, look at the stars and the planets and and try to figure out what life was all about, you know, and then put it down on paper. So in a oh, lot wow. of ways, the stutter was, it, it forced me to be alone a lot. I didn't lose the stutter until I was like well into first grade, second grade. And then it also though connected me to language and to the writing and writing just from the very start just became my salvation. It... Did, did the multi-generational, multicultural environment, did that play any part in that? Oh, yeah. So first of all, you know, when I grew up, it, it wasn't, you know, di diversity to me is such a strange thing that everyone makes a big deal about it because I grew up in diversity. You know, like right. I said, you know, there was Jews and, and Italians and Puerto Ricans and, you know, we, there was, we would, the women, and I even write this in Paradise, the women would like literally hang out the windows and they would, you know, you'd have the mix of smells of foods and dialects and you know all these cultures mixing and literally like i said you'd have you know the bodega on one corner and italian market and the you know i mean so that gave me such a variety of people to write about right to you know because all so different right and i'm hearing all these different uh you know, and my mom was, she came from Italy, so she spoke excellent English because she went to convent school. But, you know, my my grandmother, my nonna, she spoke Italian. And so I had all this wealth of information, wealth of, of visual, you know, visual things and sensory and that stayed with me. And then the multi-generational um my sister was sickly as a child. She seven, was she's passed, but she was seven years mm -hmm. old almost, six six years older, and <coughs> excuse me. Um, and so they, it, it, I kind of got not put down, but I was kind of like left out in the corner in, in a way, right? Because they took care of my sister, and she got a lot of the attention. And then I had sure. to, and then I had to stutter. You know, and then when, um, you know, when we moved to the, the big house in the suburbs and everyone, you know, the whole family moved. Right. So my aunt never okay. married and my grandmother and all that. And she so had all these all these people there, but it was still very in solitary in that respect. Um, so for me, it was just a lot of um, watching and observing and, you know, and right. seeing what was going on. Did you, did you learn multiple languages? I mean, do, Italian was your first language. I think I read so somewhere, right? I, I don't even, so what happened was, and this is interesting for any his, history buffs that are, that are listening, but when my mom came, like I said, she was, they, the family had to flee from Mussolini. They were wealthy. Oh, gosh. They, had, they, had, they had vineyards in Italy. And okay. our family had a, had a flea. And when she came over, she was already 19. But when they came over, um, her English was beautiful. And when they came to Ellis Island, they told her that she wasn't allowed to speak. They should speak Italian. They really? Her name, they, her name was Elisabetta Luisa. And she became Betty. And okay. Louise. And, um, they, you know, they, they were... You know, they ran, they fleed Italy when they didn't want to, right? They lost their home. They lost everything. Yeah. And here they are from this beautiful vineyards, and they're living in this little apartment, you know, right? In Union City, New Jersey. And they were afraid not to do what they were told. So oh, they were speaking to me um, in Italian. So I actually know very little. <laughs> Actually, wow. 
Yeah, I Having mean, grown up with wow. I know bits and pieces, you know. And when I went to Italy, I could understand some of it, but um, they it it was really very Americanized. You know, we kept some of our traditions. Okay. Um, and I feel bad about that. I and mean, that's why she didn't name me. She didn't give me an Italian first name because sure, it wanted to be more Americanized. Right. Gosh, I, I mean, did they need? I, I'm trying to think of how to put it. It wasn't like asylum that they were looking for, right? I mean, when they no, were they afraid that like the regime would come after them? I'm I'm curious. No, no it was just that they. It was just that they mostly the the army like literally took over their land. So yeah, they came on the boat, and then just with what they had on their backs. Um, and then she met my father. My father was born here. His family okay. came from Italy, but he was he was born here. But um, and then no, my grandfather had to get a job, and um, he died at gangrene. He became a tanned leather, wow. a tanner, and yeah. I mean, it was just it's a very you know kind of bizarre how things happened. So yeah. no, I don't. And then my hearing is very bad. Um, so it, it's I, I've never been able to really learn languages very easily. So even my Italian is probably not great. <laughs> the people I talk to don't know much better. So, but the written language, I mean, was a huge aspect of your of growing up. I mean, did you did you integrate any other any other languages or any other words into what you were? Because I'm dying to know what you were writing when you were like looking through this fan light. <laughs> I have, so, okay. So we were, the, you know, being an Italian traditional household and the women would be cooking in the kitchen a lot. Okay. So, and I was like five years old, four and five, six years old. And I would sit and I still have my mother's Italian cookbooks and oh my gosh. I used to write inside the covers I would never touch the recipes because she loved, I mean, she collected cookbooks. She was a great reader. She's the one where I got my reading from uh, and my dad too, but, and I have little verses yet and I did a lot of drawing. So uh, there's a lot of visual, visual things of different, um, like one with a little girl having Indian feathers on her and co very colorful and things that might've been, you know, from other cultures, but yeah, but everything was, was in English. Okay. Gosh, I guess just, it is funny though. You, you mentioned, you know, diversity is a huge thing today. It's almost funny because we are, I don't know if I want to use the word isolated, but you go into most cities in the United States and like there's a tremendous segregation, you know, yeah. that we sort of pretend doesn't exist. But because, I mean, I grew up in Los Angeles and it was like, well, yeah, of course, there's going to be a lot of different types of people. You well, know, you say it's the same as me being on the except being on the East Coast. Yeah, it, it, it was like natural for us to have. Yeah. To, have, to hear the different languages, you know, my sister's best friend was, um, she was uh, Cuban and, you know, she lit, but so, yeah, you, it, it was no, there was no need to isolate people, to shun people because you all, now maybe too, because they, no one really had a whole lot of money and, and, you know, they would share dinner. I mean, everything was almost into like, it was a melting pot. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And being closer to Ellis Island, I would imagine it would be much more of a melting pot than Los Angeles, but still. But still, yeah, but still, you know, but then again, like, you know, like we said, I'm 74. So we're going back, you know, 65 years. That scares me when I even say that, but I mean, it does. Right. So we're going, we're going back, uh, you know, a, a lot of years. You know, and it's a shame because there's that piece of that that I do wish that we had these days, right? That that piece of learning from the other people. I mean, I know like my mother wanting to learn how to cook, you know, some Puerto Rican dishes or, you know, and, you know, and the women would come over and they would teach each other. I mean, it was just, it was lovely. That piece of my yeah. life of my was, um, it was tremendous. It was tremendous. There's 
it's so hard to overstate it's the importance of having so many influences. I mean, you just, you need that, especially as a child, you know, to, to get all of those influences. Cause if you don't, I think it's really easy to end up yeah. just thinking there's only one way to do things. And, right, uh, exactly. Exactly. And, and I guess look at where we are. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much more I want to say around that, but probably none. Um, so you had mentioned that you used writing to, to get yourself out of isolation. What, um, how did that end up? Cause now, now that you, so let's see, you were about four or five. You said when the stutter really kicked in, right? That was, that was what you had said. Well, about I started five. probably when I was about three and then did, it was about three okay. years because they, you know, they took me to a speech therapist and I had, you know, okay. it have, uh, so, but I remember having it at least until I was six years old. Okay. Did, how did, how did writing, did writing help with that at all? Like how, how did that, yeah, let me stop. Did writing help with that? <laughs> so, um, yes, because, um, even as I, uh, you know, even as the speech came and, and, and I didn't have the stutter anymore, uh, you know, I mean, the stutter would, wouldn't all of a sudden disappear. Right. I mean, if I got upset sure. or something, the stutter would come back. If I, uh, even today, I hardly ever, ever get angry or get really excited. But even today, um, if I really do, uh, the stutter will start coming back a little hmm. bit. But because I had used writing as a form of communication, so it, it just stayed with me, right? There was, no, yeah. there, there was no going back from it because I just fell in love with the written word. I mean, and I write on my website, uh, you know, like words are the breath and soul in me, and they really are. Um, and then also after the abuse, um, I, I wrote about it, right? I wrote yeah. about it. I wrote yeah. about it. And the other thing it did is that it made me learn at a very young age, and I didn't know how to put words to it, but it made me learn about my androgynous nature. I see. You know, because when I would do little self-portraits of myself, it actually wasn't a girl with a skirt and a dress, right? It was, um, it, it, I, I would draw, draw boys more. So, yeah. you know, so it, it really, it, in so many ways it did because it, it made, it forced me to express myself in different ways. I th that's fascinating. I, I don't, you know, it's funny. I don't, I don't think I have any pictures that I would have drawn because I'm curious if I ever drew myself looking feminine. I would take the guess at no, though. So that's fascinating that so young you were. I and, and, and yet I didn't do any, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know. But I remember being, I remember being in, um, uh, doing it as an adult two times once my sister was a psychotherapist mm -hmm. and she, and I did it once. Um, and I know I did it once. Uh, she said to me off cuff, she goes, Oh, draw a picture of yourself. Let's have, I want to try something. And what I didn't forget, we were talking about something and I drew this guy with a big head and glasses, and, <laughs> but disconnected. My arms are disconnected, and you know. And she got so angry with me because she said, "Why? What you don't? This is like not a game. I'm asking you to do the serious." And I said, "But it is serious. This, this yeah. is who I saw myself as." And and so it's sad because, and I'm sure you relate to this, right? And and when I was in the men mental hospital for. Um, almost a year for eating disorder and, and suicide attempts, uh, among other things. And they asked me to do the same thing. And I drew a guy and, and it was, you know, I got in trouble for it <laughs> because it wasn't who I was. They told me. It wasn't who they saw. Exactly. exactly. Sure. Did anybody bring up, Hey, maybe this is gender dysphoria. Nobody. Oh, my that? goodness. So this was 1994, 1994 to 1995. And um, I won't mention the name of the clinic, but uh, but but 
it was like, no, you're not gay. You didn't have nothing happened to you. Your father didn't do that to you when nothing happened. Oh, gosh. To you and, and oh, my goodness. And it got to a point where, uh, I, you know, they had to restrain me one time. I because I had a flashback of something my father did to me. Sure. And and it was, so not just really happened to you. And here I am, you know, I'm in handcuffs. I'm straight, straight to a bed and don't tell me this. And eventually I did have to, lo- I mean, and they didn't know any better, right? It, it, it's a shame because that was 1990. I mean, it wasn't that early, you know, it wasn't the no. century. Right. But, and um, so they, they weren't they weren't like turning a hose on you afterward at the end of the day. I mean, Jesus, 90s is not, it's not crazy, that far right? back. Crazy. Yes. Crazy. And uh, I mean, my next book actually is going to be about the, the months I spent at that clinic. And again, okay. it will be a fiction. But I but, you know, it's a shame. It's sad. It was more than sad. It's that when something happens to a woman um, that you have to prove that it happened to you rather than someone believing it and helping you. Right. So, and, and that, and that goes for anyone who's had any kind of um, either gender identity issues or abuse of any kind for any reason, you know, that you have to prove it. No, right. it shouldn't have to work that way. You know, it shouldn't have to work that way. No. And I know, gosh, there's so much to unpack. Uh, <laughs> that could be another two hour show right there. But <clears throat> I know that you ended up uh, at in graduate school, you studied comparative literature. In particular, uh, you had the way you had put it is. Um, of course, I didn't write it down, but meditations on gender identity and, and, and gendered and body, I believe, is how you put the it. Gendered body. Yeah, the constructed body, the gendered body. So I was, um, so because, yeah, so I knew I was queer at a very young age, but um, because of abuse for so many years and da 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 da, it just, you know, I, I kind of, I married, I married. And, sure. um, and, uh, my ex-husband had to go to Hong Kong. He had, he worked for a large corporation, um, construction company, and we lived in Hong Kong and I had never gone to school. I would started, I would started state college, but, um, I was a single mom and I just couldn't do it anyway. Yeah. And so I studied at the university of Hong Kong and I had the most stellar education. It was, um, Back then, Hong Kong was under the British auspices. So, sure. you know, so I had, um, I had, you know, professors from Oxford and Cambridge and from the best of schools in the United wow. States. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, Harvard and, and I mean, just really, really good professors. And, and in the English system, the way it was back then, you went to school year round and also, you only studied your major. So you know, like here in the U.S., where you have to take like math and social and oh, stuff sure. this and yeah. language, and and so there you don't. From the very get go, you study your major. So I did my bachelor's, my master's, and my doctorate. And they didn't have in those days. Then back then, they didn't have um, a doctorate in identity or gender identity or anything. But that was my focus. So. Okay. Again, I, and I, I studied that and madness because I felt there was such a madness in me. But I studied that because it also helped me explore myself. Right. So sure, I could read about other women. I could read about other people that were not only women, but I mean, I you know, I remember reading the life of Oscar Wilde, and you know, and well, Virginia Woolf is one of my favorites. But you know, so right, and so the gendered body is the body that you create for society. It's not yours. Sure. Oh gosh, that's right. a powerful thought. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's what you it's what you create. So me wearing my shaved head, and you know, a 
a man's sweat, you know what what I'm saying. So it it's it, it's it's what you I I'm not in. I'm in my authentic self right now. Okay, sure. Yeah, like you're right. You're right. An authentic self. So it's it's you know it's that's what you is. But the gendered body isn't. And after a while, it it just you know ate me to the point that um, then that's how I started the eating disorder because. I, I couldn't control I see. Else, but yeah yeah you know it it's interesting that you tie i mean madness we we'll, we'll use the term madness that you tie that into it because you know for so long even homosexuality was in the DSM as a disorder yeah right and and you know gender identity disorder only got dumped from DSM 5 so relatively recently right um and there was a guy, I'm going to go off on a touch of a tangent, but I swear this no, will no, it'll no. make sense. The guy who led the committee that ended up writing DSM-5, because, you know, just a quick history lesson, you know, you had DSM-3, there was a lot of, um, like, check boxes. If you check all the boxes, you must be crazy. 3.5, clean that up a little bit. Four point, you know, the, the four, DSM-4 was better than that. Now it was more subjective. But now we've got five that sort of defocused a lot of things, in particular with with gender and sexuality. That's good, and at the same time, it's bad because now we have um, so much debate around gender and sexuality. Well, so if it's not a disorder, then what the hell is it? You know. <laughs> so I mean, which I find fascinating that we that we have to that everything must be a pathology, and so. The relationship of, I mean, you brought up Oscar Wilde, Virginia Woolf, the idea that that we had people in society who were very deep thinkers, but must have had some kind of pathology for some of their behavior. I, I mean, would, does your does your dissertation discuss this? I mean, how does... <laughs> No, I don't know what my question I, is. I, I did. I actually, my dissertation was on the uh, it was a critical analysis of Elizabeth Bishop who committed suicide. Right? She, oh my gosh! Okay, she herself a poet, American poet, and um, you're right when you're saying that because, and I I use the word madness, but I use it in a very positive aspect actually, because okay because for me. It's like when I was young and so young, really young, I adored Salvador Dali because of his, you know, his, his right? Because oh, sure. I used to look at the planets and the stars and that, you know, and then I would look at his works and they're like floating objects. And, you know, it just really intrigued me. Well, there's a kind of creative madness to me that goes into that, right? That, that allows you to do that. So... I feel the same way in my writing. Um, there's parts of it that, you know, I like to, you know, play the Mad Hatter a little bit. I like to, I like to bring it out, but it is when your authentic self and Oscar Wilde and, you know, that's what read like his letters or even Virginia Woolf, they're, they're most authentic almost when they're in what other people would say is the pathology, is the, is the madness. Yeah. Really. Yeah. They're being brilliant. It's when they're being the when they're thinking things and creating that that's when it it comes out, right? So I've always been I've been fascinated, fascinated, fascinated with madness, especially in the nineteenth century and in Victorian age and early twentieth century. I mean how they right. or even how I was in the mental hospital so they thought I was mad, right? They thought I was crazy. You know, you can't be like, you know, so just fill me with drugs and, and you know, say you're not gay and, or, you know, did that you go to the conversion camp, right? It's like one, sure. take one the other, you know, so then, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting though. It, 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 and there really is a connection. There really is a, a, a connection with the madness and the, and the creativity and in how people, um, how society looks at people, at their identities. Yeah. I, I like though how you've, how you reframe that. Cause I, I said, yes, doesn't it suck that we all get called crazy? 
But you're saying that the craziness is a power. Very empowering, I think. I think very I like that. empowering. Good. I huh? like that. No, yeah, it is very empowering. Well, because we had actually spoken about Cherish Amber. Both of us have now spoken with Cherish. Um, which, by the way, hi, Cherish. How are you doing? <laughs> um, where was I going to go? Oh, one of the things that Cherish brought up when I spoke to her, uh, spoke to her was how like a, the, the, the woman's orgasm, when you have a full body orgasm, it's sweating and mouth open and panting and, and moaning. And, and it were the same things that, that were commonly associated with lunacy. Right. And so, so they looked at, at your orgasm in particular is what she mentioned, or hopefully I'm not misrepresenting this, you know, Cherish is going to send me a mean email. <laughs> but No, you're right. Cause I studied about this actually as well. Okay. No, okay. No, no, keep on talking. No, keep on going. Well, but she, but she said, you know, when when you when you're in that state is it's a state of power. Yeah. When you can get to that state and when you can when it's okay to be in that state, it's a state of power, which is part of what fueled Victorian England that you just mentioned, you know. Right. Where everybody said, "Boy, I sure would like to have some sex." And and you had psychologists, <laughs> yeah, I guess psychologists going, "No, no, 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 no." Don't worry. It's just, let me give you some laudanum. It should be okay. There's some <laughs> no, laudanum, some exactly, arsenic. But that's exactly it, right? Right? That, that, that's, ex that's exactly it. You know, and, it is and, a and unfortunately, then you have, you learn to, to manipulate the system, right? Like I did in order yeah. to get out of the hospital. It took me, I mean, I was there, like I said, I was, I was inpatient for four months and, and, outpatient for six months but still it mm. you know, then you just you know which is not fair to yourself i mean but what are you gonna do it's but but it's true you start to, you know yeah i, I learned yeah. i learned you know if, if you're gonna go to a site if you can go to it to a, a psych ward if they're gonna take you to the emergency room if they ask you directly do you want to hurt yourself or somebody else and you say no they go yeah, okay, we'll send you home. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, don't use this, kids, okay? I mean, like, if you feel, if you need to be in a hospital, be in the hospital. But yeah, no, but what you're saying about the orgasm is true. I, I found that fascinating when I, I studied it because it, it is it is so true and unfortunate that so many people, so many women, um, I don't know about me, I can't speak for men, but so many women just don't even experience that i mean they don't experience the power and again it's your perception right how you look at it, it it's how you how you um how you embrace it right yeah 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 do, do you know what I, I didn't say this with cherish but i in my own experience like i see how do i want to say this like i can see it in my head but Giving somebody that orgasm to me has always felt extremely powerful because if you can get somebody to that state, like to me, that says something. I mean, and I didn't care if it was a man or a woman, you know, yeah. bringing somebody to that state. In fact, actually, a man was kind of funnier because, you know, <clears throat> then they're sort of laying back and... <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, you okay, buddy? No, but it's true, right? But you're pleasing someone to that extreme, to that, you know, to that, right. to that extreme. Right, right. And that, gosh, it would, in French, it's called the little death because there is a, a, a sense of losing, losing yourself to it. So, so, right. so tell me, how does this, how does this wrap, on, wrap into gender identity, though? You mean the madness? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. I think, I think just being authentic. I, th I mm. think that, you know, I think like people think and people think that when I say people, I, you know, I mean, general, both public and people that are closer to me, 
Um, sure. They just, you know, they just say, well, you know, God, why do you have to wear your hair shaved? And why do you have to dress like that? And, you know, like, 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 what's wrong with you? What, why do you have to write, you know, why do you have to write queer erotica? You know, I mean, why do you have to do this for? It's like, what's wrong? Well, they're, they're assigning me the fact that I'm mad, right? That, that there's a mess right. to me. There's a, some type of pathology, something that's, that's wacky, Right. And for me, I take that and I just run with it with a laugh on my face, a smile <laughs> on my face. And and to me, that's again, it's it's it makes me it it makes me feel so empowered to who I am. I'll give you an example. I got a I got a job working at the US Capitol back in 2012 and yeah, I was a tour guide and but I was also like worked in the education department and you know and all yeah. I was trying to push an LGBTQ something in their in their museum. But anyway, and when you had and when I first got the job there and you had to work, I had to wear a tie, a, a white starch shirt and a black tie and of course the, the blazer with uh, the emblem of the US Capitol and Sure. And I would I put that on the first time and we had to wear it, right? So it was part of the job. And all the women, all the gals were like moaning and groaning and oh my God. And they would never like want to tie the tie right. And here I am with the tie is perfectly perfectly <laughs> perfectly knotted and my shaved head and man, sure. I'm sure I'm just strutting, right? I feel oh my goodness. And the public, and it was so accepting. Here I am in the U.S. Capitol, thousands of people seeing me every day. Right. And here right. I am in my in my male attire. And it's right, right? So it made me think. So you think about this a second. All right. So because I had to do it as a job, it was all of a sudden acceptable. Now, it, right. did, it did help. And it was interesting because I would get comments from my supervisors how confident I, I looked. And felt, but of course, it was coming from the inside, right? Of you know, being There's, able to dress like a man and and be paid for it, and <laughs> have it, you know, and shine, right? Looking like that, right? That you was know. not the first time that you had experienced that, though, was it? It was 2012. A, I was in a in a public place okay. that that it was. Yeah, that was accepted. Yes, it was. Okay. Because sometimes well, oh. I'll go out and I'll get and, and I'll get a, uh, you know, kind of someone looking at me cross-eyed or whatever, you know. But it's it, it is what it is. Sure, I, and I get I get what you're saying. I I reeled that back in a little bit because you were like, well, where it was acceptable, and I went, oh, yeah, that's different because. I don't know that there's any place I could go. <laughs> like, I don't think I could get a job where wearing a skirt, people would be like, well, yeah, that's totally normal. Like the ge the general public anyway. So I get yeah. it. Yeah, that's. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's interesting. Like attire has gotten a little bit looser, you know, easier now, I think, for people, you know, yeah. I think people can, right? You can, you know, they have androgynous clothes and which is, which is great that they have it now, but um even back then, like 10 years ago, it wasn't, it wasn't the case. It wasn't the norm. Mm -hmm. And people no. would laugh at me at work because they, you know, they, I was like, like, what are you, a lunatic? I mean, it really was, you know, like, a, so that's where I say that the madness has always fascinated me because I think it's, for me, it's always, if you look at it in perspective from positive perspective, it's, it, for me, it's always inspired me to, inspired me to, to, be who I am and then to, you know, to also, you know, like write about it and, and not brag, mm -hmm. about it, but kind of like, you know, be open with it. Sure. Sure. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Th there was a thought that I had that fell out of my head as soon as, as soon as I, as soon as you stopped talking, I was like, Oh damn. But <laughs> cause it might've been, might've been a good one too, but um i'll come back i'll come back and if it doesn't that's fine we'll we'll record another show what do you think <laughs> yes <laughs> i 
we have to, you you know, know, it's a lot to unpack. Like I said, it's a lot to unpack because it's, there's so much, you know, there's so much when it comes to, uh, you know, you've got like the piece of the trauma, you got the piece of the being creative, you got the piece of the yep. identity and the gender and, and, and it's a lot, but you know, it, it's what makes you and I sitting here. Right? It, what makes you right. and I sitting right. here. Right. You are. Do, you know, it's a quick story too, because because when I was in graduate school, so this would have been mid nineties, actually ninety four ninety five. Um, I so I had just I had a fiance who broke up with me four days before the wedding. <gasps> yeah. Oh my goodness. I don't know exactly why. For what it's worth, and I don't want to go into this story because <laughs> it's already embarrassing enough. But. But I went to, so when I was in Georgia, so it was in small town, Georgia. Okay. Grew up in Los Angeles, San Diego. I had lived there for undergrad, small town, Georgia. And I thought, well, Jesus, you know, if I don't, like, if I just get to be whoever I want to be, I'm going to go be that person. And so I had dyed my hair black. It was about waist length, I think at that time. And, um, I would just go out wearing clothes that I liked, you know, I gave myself a different name and I know I went to parties uh, that were given by other people in the chemistry department. <sighs> Boy, I already said I'd been jilted. Plus I was a chemist. Boy, how dorky can you get? But <laughs> point being that I went to these, I remember that, that somebody was like, well, what, how come, why are you wearing, like you're wearing skirts and a skirt, a skirt and heels. What's going on? I was like, well, I, that's how I feel comfortable. And the person went, you're from California, aren't you? And I went, <laughs> I go, yeah. The person goes, oh, okay. It, it was like that, like that right there. They're like, well, you're from California. That's a sense of madness just right That's there. Interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. That's right? That is funny. Made no, it, it was almost, it was fascinating. There was at least one person who never wanted to talk to me again, which was fine. Cause you know, he was, he had this huge, the hugest roundest head. <laughs> that was all I remember this guy's a big, huge round head. But the the point of the story was just supposed to be that it was it was interesting to see that people just went, well, you know, California. There's just weird out there, you know. Yeah. And it was kind of accepted. I don't know if I would say accepted, but like nobody came after me with pitchforks and torches. Would you carry more multiple pitchforks? I don't know. <laughs> Pitchfork and torches. Nobody seem to care. And, and, uh, I don't know, maybe it was just because it was a form of madness and they thought, yeah, that's cool. Whatever. Yeah, they probably did. I mean, they, you know, yeah, you were, you, yeah. You know, weren't fascinating. Anything hurting them or hurting anything or, you know, so, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, like I grew up in, like I said, New Jersey, but right outside New York city. Right. So I would go into right. the city when I was a kid and all the time. And, uh, you know, and then when I got older, going to the lesbian bars and all there. But, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, it's a little bit more acceptable. It's, I, I think, on, on the coast. But it's funny how you, yeah. you said it. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. That, that's fine. <laughs> you, that you have a reason. You have a reason to be the way you are. And, yes. And, and I mean, you know, and, and you'd wonder, gosh, so I need to be that way. That's the only way I'll be accepted because of where I come from, you know. <sighs> But see, like at this point now, I don't. When you said it can be empowering, like that, a light snapped on in my head because I went, "Oh, it can be," because it's a source of creativity. It's a source of, I mean, that source of authenticity. Ooh, how do I want to say it? It's like it, like it causes you to glow. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, I don't. If I spent fifty-two years kind of dim. I mean, there are many people who think I'm still dim, but. I'm, I meant like physically, you know, two years later, I think that I, like I have a glow now because it's it's I've embraced the madness and, yeah. and it it caused. I have a light shining. It's a purple light shining out from 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 inside me. So yeah. I love this. I yeah. think it's a great it's a great. Uh, so I am curious, though, because because now I've given because I gave my experience coming from from assigned male at birth sort of standpoint. And you gave, you gave a, a story from an assigned female at birth standpoint, but your, your graduate studies 
focused, um, they were feminist meditations is how it's put. Yes, because as a, uh, as a, because like my pronouns are she, her, and boy, right? B-O-Y. So it's like, okay. it's like, I, I, I welcome my female body. All right. But I, I, I do have a, a huge part of me that, you know, I wish I had an extra organ, right? I wouldn't want to give away what I have, but I, you know, I mean, so there's part of me that, that is very, you know, is very masculine in, in sure. I mean, so where was I going with that? I wish I could tell you. Do you, you want me to to, to direct a touch? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know. I was trying to remember why why I said that. Why can, you came out with something, and now I'm oh oh for the studies. So the feminist studies. So basically, <laughs> right. what I'm after right is are women who were the kind of the same how I felt right the women who dressed masculine who had the who had the um, who had the same queer you know, behavior or personality, okay. you know, kind of DNA in them that I did. Yeah. So All right. never, yeah, I've never wanted to study male or men, but which now that you say that is kind of fascinating to me that I never did because I feel that, I mean, I feel so much that way. So that's I, Right. And I guess that was, what the question I would, I guess it was kind of where I was going to go because I think when I learned about feminism, which by the way, I learned about it from like this French, this French lady who taught me existential literature, I read a bunch of existential letter, literature with her. So, you know, she may not have had the exact, you know, Gloria Steinem sort of view on this, but uh, she, she taught me that feminism was more about integrating the divine feminine into society that the, we need any more masculinity. We need like women acting more masculine, but and not necessarily that men needed to act more feminine, but rather the idea of an integration that, that you needed both, that you need to, you need both an active and directing force as well as a nurturing and completing force. So I guess that's why I wondered if, if maybe that, so, so, Go ahead. Um, so you're talking about, and yeah, so when that's feminism, right? Like I studied French fe feminism, but when I say feminist and really it's, it's probably I'm using the term wrongly because I just mean, um, feminine, female, fem female, fem not, okay. so yeah, cause you're exactly right on what you're saying about the feminism, right? And I'm okay. not a feminist at, at all. Understood. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. So I'm sorry. That that was that was mine. I need to correct that. Actually, <laughs> I need to no, I, my bio because it really isn't. I didn't realize that that would bring people to think of feminism. Yeah. Well, but it is. It is fascinating, right? I mean, so much of your, so much of your identity focuses on on the masculine. I and and you are. These meditations came just because this this was who you are, and you, you you were using what you have to work with, as it were. Uh, am I framing that correctly? Uh, at the, yes, at, yeah, at, at the time, and it and like my writing, I write a gay romance. I don't write lesbian. Not, not, I mean, Paradise is lesbian because it, it's a memoir, um, oh, yeah. and I have one lesbian books out of seven, but I. I much prefer writing the male point of view or the, you know, the male genre. So I don't know, go figure. I, I, I really have to, I really have to, cause you really made me think about this. Uh, you really made me kind of think about this because it's interesting that, I mean, and I, I've always felt this masculine, but I guess I didn't allow myself to embrace it until really until much older. Hmm. I mean, until really until my early fifties. Okay. 
point. I mean, same here, I guess. So, you yeah. know, I can't, I can't criticize you, but do you, on that note, and I mean, then I'm going to ask you for an opinion that of course is going to be <laughs> some, sometime it'll be popular with some people who may not, but, um, is, is, is investigating our identity, is that part of the madness? Is that part of how we become empowered because we embrace something that is outside of us and make it our own so that we become real? Yes, I believe that. I believe there's no way you can be authentic unless you do the exploration, unless you open yourself up and I, I'm big on meditating. I'm big on on um, on finding different resource, like finding different resources where I can like really open my mind up. And I don't know if it started to because as a child I did that, right? I, I you know exploring just to be able to like write messages and and write. But I do believe that you can't do it unless unless you do. The more that you get inside yourself, the more I think, number one, you're going to be able to accept other people because the Praise. more you see what the that you're not just an insular um, like tube and, and like, you know, very narrow. Um, well, there are narrow minded people, but I mean, the more you're willing to explore, to open, to um do what's in your mind, right? Like me, take, you know, I, I, when I have like a speaking engagement and I'll make people, I will tell people, do a self-portrait right now. Just do a self-portrait right now. See what comes up. Don't censor it. Just put whatever that's, yeah. you want to make yourself a unicorn if you want to give yourself wings <laughs> because it all means something. It all means something when you start, you know, uh, so... Yes. And, and I think, and even today I find that I, I still work off my madness, right? I still work off my exploring, exploring it. It, it, you, yeah. it doesn't matter. The age makes no difference. It's, um, it's a passion you have inside to want to be doing that. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, I think it's an ongoing process. It never ends. Yeah. You always have to continue to find who you are. Or let me, how about if I say that you can always find more bits of who you are? More, yes. And that's the better way. Exactly. Better way to say that. I. It makes me very sad for, yeah, there are a lot of children who, who, are born to parents now who are just like, look, I've got your identity for you. You, you were born into this family. Here you go. Good luck. And unfortunately, usually the luck is very poor because yeah. you can't be told who you are. No, no. And, and like I said, even at, you know, my age, people still tell me I'm not supposed to be who I am. <laughs> so, right. So it's, you know, it's, you, you just, and and I'm I'm truly I'm truly uh, have come to a place in my life where I'm happy and um, I like who I am, you know I like what I stand for. I have a wonderful life, and it's um, I'm really able just to unless someone's out to hurt me, you know I'm able to accept people and okay that's you know that's your opinion. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's important for when you're trying to, it's important, I think, when you're trying to find yourself to really be careful of the people you have around you, right? You know, you don't want the toxic people around, you don't want the negative sure. people around, you know, so that's, that's, uh, and up until even this year, there was a couple of people that, you know, I thought, okay, I just really need to. You know, I need to walk away. I need to, you know, I, you know, it wasn't like any big relationship. I mean, just friends. So, you know, I make a really intention. I'm very intentional about who I talk to. <laughs> I mean, seriously, even with the podcast, I'm very intentional who I talk to, who I have around me. And if they're not going to be accepting, you know, you could, we could disagree. You and I can disagree on a subject. We can disagree on things, right? How we sure. see things. But 
you know, you know, it's coming from a place of, of openness. Right. Right. I'm, this seems like such a cliched question, like sounds very hackneyed in my head, but I'm going to ask it. Cause I think it's, I think it would be interesting. You have lived a long life of, sorry, I shouldn't say long life, but you've lived a life of lived a long life. You could, <laughs> you could well, lived, you've did, lived a life with a lot of exploration. That was really what I was trying to say. And <clears throat> Some of this came from a sense of isolation where you hid yourself away in an attic. And so now looking back, I mean, like if you, if you were be, you were to be able to take it, I can't even say it. If you were to, <laughs> I'll try it one third time, holding up two fingers. If you were able to get a time machine and go back and talk to your six year old self, would you give yourself any other advice? Would you give yourself any tips? Like, what would you say to yourself? To my six-year-old self, I'd say that you're doing, you did the best you could. You know, you really did the best you could. You, you, you know, and I still isolate. I, I it's, it's something that uh, I have to force myself to go out sometimes. Mm. I, I really do. Um, I have my house and my dogs and, you know, my laptop and I'm good to go, you know, so, um, it, it, I, I really, yeah, it, it's more the, it's more if I could go back to my teenage years when I first realized that's the, that's the, that's the girl that, that I feel that I wish would have been, you know, I, I say braver, but I, I went through hell as a, as a kid. So, uh, but you know, more, I don't know. I, I can't, I can't say it, you know, just more aware and, and just, you know, do it right. Just be yourself. It, it just took me so many years to get over the, you know, to go from trauma to transformation. It was, it took, it yeah. took a lifetime. I mean, it really did, has taken a lifetime. So, but my, the four-year-old, she, you know, I, I think she was happy in her little, in her little attic space, looking at the, you know, looking out the window and, and, uh, you know, I, yeah, that's a great question, by the way. I did, it felt kind of hackneyed, but... <laughs> <laughs> but and it's not a happy question. It's a great question because I've never I've never done that. But I mean, I could just picture me and and well, you know, the thing is, I think when how do I want to put this? Somebody asked me recently, you know, if you if you could have been born cisgender, like now, from where I am now, if I could be born cisgender, if I could go back and relive my life. Would I do it? And it's kind of a similar question where it's like, well, if I could do something that was going to affect all the rest of my life, would I want to? And I had to think on that. And I said, no, no, I don't think I would. Because I think, much like you've been saying during this this uh, discussion, that from that we gain our power yeah. from, from the adversity, from the... Yeah. I don't want to say the overcoming, but from the the madness. Yeah. And, and I I would hate at this, like, I think at this point, now I have the ability to talk to some of these things. And I don't think I would have if I went back to whatever, five years right. old and, and, and made myself cisgender. So. Right. I mean, the, the so resilience I, that we have is, is, is incredible. And, and the, you know, yeah. I just feel that the human spirit is just so indefatigable. It's, it's just like, it, you know, it, it's, you know, if you don't lose your spirit, I, I, I think it means, you know, it means the world. I mean, it, it really does. Right. It just, yeah. you know, and all you need is one little, one little, one little spark of hope, one little thing that you can, you know, you just focus on yes. and, and, and get you through to the next step, the next step, the next step. And then it, you know. Right. Right. And, and I guess it's very disappointing that we have a, a society that's really good at just stamping out those sparks, you yeah. know, so many in, in our community in particular, but I won't even just say, you know, the queer community, 
there are people whose sparks get stamped out when they're young and that's it. No, I, I, I see it. You know, I've got five grandchildren and, and I have one grandson who's, 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 um, you know, he's, he, he doesn't follow the, the role of that, the other kids and, you know, and he gets bullied for it. It's, it, it's, sure. it, it's a shame, but you're right. But then you've got, you know, the teachers that don't maybe handle it like they could or counselors that don't handle it like they should. And, you know, but, um, so it's it's good that he's got parents that understand him, and you know certainly he I, I tell him because I'll talk to him and you know and and I'll say you know you know look at look at me look with the shaved head and everything you know you can be who you are, <laughs> so. right, right. Yeah. It, and what's funny is I think kids kids internalize. Um, no, that's not really the word I want to use. Like they understand, they understand gender change very, they understand, let, let me re use a different word there. They understand fluid gender very easily. Yes. I, I, it's, it's, I know people, you know, some, a group of people in particular, family that I know in particular, who's like, oh, wait, you transitioned while we were gone? I'm not sure if we want, to, want you near our children. We'll talk to you and maybe we'll see if you're okay. But I'm thinking, no, your kids are going to be the ones who are going to get it. <laughs> wow. Someone They're, said that to you? Not to me directly, to, to my wife, but I, Yeah. Yeah, it was it was pretty much, you know, they they found out I had transitioned. They had gone away for a couple of years, I think, and came back. And now they're like, mm, I'm not sure if your kid can play with our kids. Wow. Because. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And, and the thing is, it is at the kids. Absolutely. Like, I'm sure the kids would see me and they'd be like, oh, my God, can I touch your hair? Like 10 bucks. said so these kids would have no trouble whatsoever. They'd just be like, sure, you're wearing a skirt now. Fine. Yeah, Who cares? Of you course. Know. yeah, it's, you know, it's and, and it goes back to what I was saying before about, you know, 50 years ago, the diversity. I mean, there was no right. problems. There was just no issue, you know, there, right. was, there right. was no issue. It was, you know, all these people from, and, you know, a lot of people from Alice, a lot of people just, you know, immigrating into this, into this one big place and yeah it's it's to me it, it, it's it's the same thing i just think people make an issue out of something that shouldn't be there because it doesn't touch them their spirit it's it's yeah it's inside yeah yes very much i could probably talk to you for the next two hours but <laughs> <laughs> but we're running low on time so let me how do people find karen ann cocioli um my website so, and also not only me, but my alter ego, author Annie Moon. So, um, and th that's where I, I kind of let my, that's where, like I said, I really let my madness out. Uh, but I write, you know, that's gay erotica and um, it's fun. I'm on Instagram. Please get on my website. Feel free to contact me. I'm, I love talking to groups, LGBTQ groups, especially um, not only writing groups, but just about my experience and, you know, what I have to offer. So, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a ton to offer. I just, do you know, quickie story here, because I'm Karen and I met through a service, through a podcast matching service. And I don't know, we exchanged like a couple of messages back and forth. And I know I gave you a, an email address. And then we just started emailing we had like a couple of weeks. It was pretty voluminous. I was just like, gosh, what a fascinating person. You're, I mean, you're, you're a great, is it conversationalist? Can you say that with email? I guess I'm, I'm not sure, but it, you know, you're so fascinating. I'm okay. Good. <laughs> you're so fascinating. And I'm so glad that I, that I met you. It's, it's really, it's, it's enriched my life. So thank you. No, it, it goes, it goes both ways. It really does. It really does. I said, I, I like only the best people around me. So <laughs> I feel honored 
for yeah. I mean, that sounded that sounded sarcastic. Was not. I mean, not in the least. No, so no, I know it wasn't. I know you got a good heart. You've got such a generous <laughs> Thank heart. You. And it, it comes. Oh. It comes through. It does. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm glad it does. So, all right. Well, let me go ahead and shut this down then. Um, so I want to thank everybody, all of our listeners, and I am Amethyst Deherrick. You've been listening to Gender Identity Weekly. I've been talking with Karen Ann Cocioli about gender identity, madness, and the empowerment that comes from, from within. Thank you again, Karen. You're welcome. <laughs>